In this video, I'll take a look at VCO versus DCO. So that's the difference in voltage controlled analog versus digitally controlled analog. I'll be looking at why VCO is considered to be more natural and warm sounding and what manufacturers and developers have done through artificially introducing analog drift circuits and emulations to recreate the instability inherent in VCOs. And this video is a clip from the series I'm creating from my patrons called How to Program Almost Any Synth, in which I look at the main components of analog synthesis and how they're used by pretty much every synth you've ever heard of. So oscillators, low frequency oscillator, filters, mixer and modulation section with envelopes. But this episode feels like it stands on its own as a good description of VCO versus DCO rather than part of a programming tutorial series. So I thought I'd upload it here as well. But when I mention things that I've previously talked about, don't think you've missed anything. They're just because they're from a, as I say, it's from a, it's from a series of videos. But of course you could become a patron and see the rest as I, as I create them. But hopefully this will help anyone understand the differences as it's something that does crop up from time to time in, in, in comments on the videos. And I've already touched on it a few times in my comparisons. So DCO versus VCO. This is a VCO synth, it's got voltage controlled oscillator, it says so here. And when I press a key, the pitch of the oscillator is determined by the voltage that's produced by me pushing a key. I'm not sure how it does it in this, but there's loads of ways of doing it. And in the old days, there were some really quite inventive ones. In the Pro One, for example, it's got what's known as a J-wire keyboard, and there's literally like a thick wire or bar at the back behind the keys, and each of the keys has got a little wire that touches it as you press the key. And when these make contact, it completes an electrical circuit and the different lengths of the electrical circuit produces different voltages, different voltages produce different pitches on the oscillator, which is dead simple, but, but it's really unreliable. And every time you play the thing, I'm getting double clicks and all sorts of stuff. Most modular systems use a one volt per octave standard. On a four octave keyboard, you'd have a four volt difference between the top and the bottom C. On a five octave keyboard, you have a five volt difference between the top and the bottom C. And that's when you hear people talking about calibrating their oscillators and calibrating the synth. You might have heard people talking about calibrating the new Behringer kit and you've got to get in with a tiny screwdriver. And that's because you've got to pick the right voltage and then you've got to pick how that voltage is spread over the keyboard. So there's normally two screws, one to get the voltage in tune and then one to get the actual spread right across the keyboard. But from this episode's point of view, won't worry about all that sort of stuff. Um, just assume that the keyboard or MIDI note from wherever will determine the pitch an oscillator plays. So they're always running in the background at whatever pitch was determined by the last control voltage they received. And if sometimes you get bleed through an oscillators and you can just hear a tiny little tone coming through because it's running, running, running constantly. But normally you only hear an oscillator once a gate is opened and the amplitude envelope is triggered by pressing the key which triggers both the filter and the amplitude envelopes and hey presto, we've got a sound. But once I've stopped, that's still running in the background at that pitch. So looking at that a little bit deeper using the ARP Odyssey because that's got this VCA gain knob or slider here which allows sounds from the mixer to pass through without having gone through the envelope generators. So generally what you normally get, as I say, is you hear the sound when you hit the key. But on this, you can hear the sounds running continuously. So whatever I press, it's running continuously in the background. But why would you want that? Sometimes you might want a drone. So things like the grandmother's got a, a switch for a drone. The Pro One has, my Synthesizer 100F has, the Mini Moog doesn't. I think the Rev 2 and the Prophet 8. The Prophet 8's got a, a knob to do it with. The Rev 2, I think it's in a menu. That's a really handy thing to have, especially if you can bring external audio in. So here we've got the TR-09. So if I just take the mixer down, as in the VCO1 and VCO2 aren't gonna be coming out. Nothing's coming through. This is playing through here. So let's show that again. And that's why you might want to do it. You've got access to the filter for other sounds. I suppose you could play them all together. Let's try that.
hours of fun. So VCOs, what I've just explained, the simple control voltage is used to tune the oscillator. But the problem with this is that the voltage supplied to the oscillator changes as circuits heat up and as they cool down, which is why the Mini Moog, for example, has got the really handy 440 hertz oscillator to easily tune the synth. And that always runs at 440 hertz, so you know when you've gone out of tune. And you'll find pretty much every VCO synth's got a tune knob. I think they all have, whether it's hidden around the back or on the front. And if it hasn't got a tune in knob, it'll have something in the menu like this. We've got the master tune uh, in the global menu. Pretty much any old VCO synth over the course of a gig or a studio session, they would or most likely will have gone out of tune, which is a real pain. So to avoid this, later analog synths used DCOs or digitally controlled oscillators. And this uses a digital circuit to clock the speed of the oscillator. So it's telling the oscillator when to fire and exactly what speed. So 440 hertz is always exactly 440 hertz, or that's the theory at least. But it keeps things in tune much more effectively. Although you might notice just in this top corner here, you do have a tune knob around the back. But generally, these don't really go out of tune over the course of a session or, or while you're playing a gig. Because it's locking onto a digitally produced clock rather than a voltage produced by analog circuitry that could be inconsistent. So all the Junos, like the 6, the 60 and the 106, the Korg Poly 800, the Alpha Junos, JX3P, JX8P, all use DCOs. As do plenty of newer synths like Prophet 8 and the Rev 2. But this is where the VCO versus DCO debate then starts, with DCOs sometimes being seen uh, by some as inferior, too clean or not as warm as VCOs. And that's because of the tiny inconsistencies of the VCOs making the sound more natural, with minuscule changes in pitch as you hold a note. Which subconsciously, some people say, your brain hears as a more natural sound, makes things sound warmer and nicer. But there are a lot of misconceptions here. A lot of folks think things like the Junos are uh, VCO, for example, just because they're old analog classics when actually, as I said, these are DCO. And a lot of people think DCOs are digital oscillators. I get this sometimes on the, on the, on the YouTube channel. You know, I, didn't, I can't believe it's a DCO. I thought it was an analog synth. I, I didn't realize I had digital oscillators. They're not digital. They're just digitally controlled analog oscillators. So the waveform itself may have tiny inconsistencies that are audible, but the tuning won't. So the sound is still created by voltages passing through transistors, resistors, and capacitors. It's not a digitally created sound. And here's a section from my Pro 6 versus Rev 2 video, where I just take a look at the differences between DCO and VCO. So is there a difference between a VCO and a DCO? Let's just put the saw back on. Now we look at that sort of frequency there, waving. And that changes as different voices come into play, as the phase of different waves is changing. So let's try that up here. So different as well, but they're not moving like these are. I'm taking the oscillator drift or the slop off, make sure that's on zero. So that could quite possibly be a DCO versus VCO. That's maybe why people think the VCO sound warmer because the sound's sort of got some movement in it. So here's another way of looking at it. The 106 has got six DCOs all tuned perfectly. But when we play them all together in a unison mode, it sounds a bit odd, it sounds a bit phasey because the waves are sort of canceling each other out or something. So let's have a listen to that. Normally you have, and put it into unison mode. <laughs> it's a really weird sound, isn't it? I mean, it's another palette of tones, but what you expect to get is a much bigger, deeper sound because you've got six oscillators all slightly detuned, creating sort of a big, hefty tone. So let's look at this on the Prophet 6 of VCO. That's a single sawtooth, single oscillator playing. Put it into unison mode. 
Got the six playing there and they sound pretty much like the Juno actually at the minute because the tuning on this VCO is pretty, pretty hot. Although it's not quite as phasey and it is a bit richer. But we do have modelled oscillator drifter, what they call slop here. And that's more like what you'd expect from a VCO in unison mode. Each of the oscillators is tuned slightly differently. And that's what unison mode would normally sound like on an old poly. So what is this slop I've just turned on there? It's to avoid things sounding too controlled and adds a little inconsistency and warmth or depth to a tone. I think Dave Smith first brought this out in his Prophet 8, which I loved, but it wasn't quite sloppy enough for me. It only went to about, about here. And I always wanted it to go to about there. <laughs> It just wasn't sloppy enough for me, but the Rev 2 has got much more slop. It's much more like the Prophet 6. So it models the drift you get in the oscillators on an old sort of vintage synth by just adding small inconsistencies and drifting to the off oscillator tuning. I mean, if your synth sounded like that, you probably want to take it back. Let's listen to a C major. That's completely out of tune, doesn't it? So here's it, perfectly in tune. <laughs> but when it's around here, it's really nice. Nice and rich and lush. Let's take it off. Bit more in tune, bit more harsh. Slop on again. I think a demo of this with the DeepMind 12 versus the Prophet 6 as well. So DeepMind 12 DCO, and I think if you put their sort of their slot function on around two or three percent, it's sort of equated to the VCO-ness of this when it's on zero. Well, you can put a bit of slop on this, and let's just try that, see if it makes any difference. So let's go into the poly mode, oscillate a drift, just turn it up a little, tiny bit to one. There you go, some movement, so put it onto two. So that's interesting, the oscillator drift of about two um, equates to the VCO movement in this. And you have functions like the slop in, in UHE's Diva, for example, or UHE's Diva, and in other soft synths now because it does generate just a nice bit of warmth. It gives that little bit of movement you need to make it sound a bit more vintage. I think the first one I saw it on was the Oberheim emulation, the, um, the OPX Pro 2, which can make it just sound like the, the sort of devil's taken over. <laughs> but it does have that sort of sloppy chorus, chorus sort of sound, really nice. Taking a look at Yuhi's Diva, the dinosaur inspired virtual analog, and this has got on this trimmers page down here, it's got loads of different options for adding sort of slop and detune. And here we've got oscillator detune. So imagine you've got a three oscillator synth with eight voices. So you've got one, two, three for each of the voices, and then you've got eight voices. So we're using one voice here. So um, that's all these along the top. And you can imagine having all the sort of circuit board with 24 little little screws on it and how how complex that could be so this is sort of these are sort of emulating the screws being sort of wrong i suppose the calibration being out and you've got a, a master detune down here so what i've done is i've programmed the first four to be flat and the second four to be sharp and this is obviously going to be a broken synth there you go so let's make that a little bit more gentle shall we so just sort of randomize it slightly and bring the detune master down a bit. So everything's slightly out of tune, but in a nice way. If we 
take the detune to zero. Everything's spot on, isn't it? So listen to that again. Then whack the detune up. So it's out of tune there. So that emulates the tuning being incorrect in each of the oscillators. And we've also got voice drift as well, which is the sort of instability in the, in the oscillators themselves. So without it, then let's add some. You can hear that sort of buzzing round and wavering round a little bit. It's something that I noticed on a couple of the, the new Behringer synths. Sort of really shows that they are uh, true VCOs. They're not as bad as that, obviously. So if you had a bit of voice drift, a bit of detune. Much nicer. And early virtual analogs like the Access Virus don't have this capability. So lots of DCOs, all the early vintage DCOs don't have this option. But the Prophet 8 did, and now the Rev 2 does, as I said earlier. And early virtual analogs don't have it as well, like the Access Virus, for example, doesn't have it, which is why some people think it sounds harsh. So it'd be nice for a little update there. So we've got detune, we've got voice drift, and we've also got variance on the cutoff, the envelope, the pulse within the glide. So let's put some variance on the envelope, shall we? Have a listen to that. Let's just do a little resonant bass line thing. So you can hear some are quick, some are slow. Again, I'm exaggerating here, I've got it on full. But you can see how that can give a much more natural feel to a sound. And you randomise it using this switch here. Turn it down a bit. So it's sort of imperceptible, but it is there, and it just might make your ears feel that it sounds a bit more interesting, a bit more natural, as I say. So yeah, it's a great one for demonstrating exactly what slop and detune are, this. And it's a great instrument itself, highly recommended. Well, I hope that shed some light on DCO versus VCO, oscillator drift, uh, slop, oscillator variance, and all the rest of it, and how you can make a DCO or a virtual analogue sound a bit more warm and lush. It's sort of almost an aside from the tutorials in a way and deserve its own little episode. Uh, but next, I'm going to be just rounding off the oscillators by taking a look at the sort of types of oscillators you've got. Like you've got main oscillators and you've got noise plus subs and every synth's got a mixture of those. Plus, we'll be back to making some sounds. So please subscribe if you haven't already and if you'd like to become a patron of the channel, go over to my Patreon page where you can access the series that this is part of. As I say, it's under development at the minute. They take ages to make these things, but I want to make it as, as comprehensive as possible and as, uh, as, as clear as I can. So, see you next time.